Be sure to watch Dialogue with Lytton on this station with Missouri Congressman Jerry Lytton and his guest, the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs for New York City. So you've got an interest in the way food reaches the supermarket, because if your good sows get into You have learned so bacon, much since what? you came to New York. <laughs> I know what a guilt is, too, you know. <laughs> you know, pardon me for interrupting her, but she had not seen a hog until I showed her one in Missouri. I know, I know. <laughs> it's absolutely true. <laughs> Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. Our guest today is Commissioner of Consumer Affairs for New York City, Eleanor Guggenheimer. What do you think brings the people out today, what's on their minds, and what do you think just might be asked? Oh, I don't know what's on other people's mind, but I think it's going to be very interesting to Here's some discussions from someone from New York and their consumer affairs and their problems from day-to-day -day living when I know it's entirely different than it is out here in the Middle West and the uh, small cities and towns. And I think we'll uh, both get something from it, both she will from us and us from her. What do you think might be asked here today? Um, I'm interested in uh, who won this battle on the tax situation. Uh-huh. Here uh, we've, last few days. Uh, <laughs> we've had a lot of talk about that, haven't we? Congress claimed they won it, and the president claims he won it. And, we have and two, why, why, why are there so far apart all the time? Well, we have two good people here, very important people, and maybe they'll give us some answers. Thank you. Hi, what, do, what brings you out to the meeting today? Well, I'm curious. Uh, Ms. Guggenheimer has been to northwest Missouri before and traveled through some of the uh, agricultural properties in this area. I'm curious now what sort of understanding she has on agriculture and uh, what it's like on the other side of the food line. We're down here producing and she's up there eating. That's I don't want right. to know. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to see it from two sides today, right? right? Thank you. Hi, sir. And what brings you out to this meeting? Well, I'm a regular attender. I'm a neighbor of Jerry's. Been all my life. And Mrs. Guggenheimer didn't get the privilege of coming to my farm. I don't know how <laughs> come. But I'm curious to know what happens to our low prices. How come these consumers are crying so much about the high cost of food? when we're not getting it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering who's getting it. Mm -hmm. Maybe she can straighten us out. I think they like that one, and I think they want an answer to that. Well, we've heard from all the people with the questions. I'm sure there will be others. Now, let's hear from the man who's expected to come up with the answers. See, I wear this vest to impress the people from New York City. I normally wear overalls. And I scrape my feet off when I walk in, too. <laughs> Back when we had consumer boycotts around the country, and it appeared to be a great wedge that was driven between the farmer and the people in the city and the producer and the consumer, I invited the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs from New York City to come out here to Missouri and to meet the farmers firsthand, to walk in their feedlots, to visit their dairy barns, to have breakfast with their sons and daughters in the FFA and the 4-H, to have lunch with them in their farm homes, to go to church with them one Sunday morning, to get better acquainted with the problems of food production firsthand. Commissioner and her husband came out here at my invitation. We spent three days doing just that. 
And the kind of a dialogue that developed between the farm people in Missouri and Eleanor Guggenheimer was something I won't forget. One of the most beautiful three days I think I'd ever spent in my life because this seemingly battle between the city and the country, this big feeling of irritation between the farmers in the Middle West and the consumers in New York City seemed to dissipate as we discussed common problems. Well, back when the commissioner was here, the farmers were telling her, what's good for the rural America is good for the cities. And now that New York City has its problems, the shoe's on the other foot. Let's give a real Missouri welcome to the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs in New York City, my friend and soon to be yours, Eleanor Guggenheimer. Ellie, it's great to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, and I hope you noticed that I wiped my feet off before I came up here. <laughs> oh, that was hitting below the belt. <laughs> Happy to have you here. We have microphones around the room, Eleanor, and we never really know what questions are going to be asked. I'd like to ask the people to come to the mic to state your name and your town, and we'll see what develops. Yes. Now that things have really hit home, and New York City was faced with default and the urgency of putting New York City's house in order by the federal legislation that was passed to help New York City. Has the attitude of the people of the city changed and the workers? Is there more of a willingness to go along with some cutbacks in this area or that area? You can't suddenly undo 40 years of going in one direction. And it isn't possible to simply slash across. You know that yourself. If, you're, if you've got a farm or something operating in a certain way, uh, and you're suddenly told to cut back a certain percentage. You can do that in time, but you can't do it in one week. Right now, in my office, we've just been given orders to fire 92 people. That is one third of my office. It has a lot of, of very, very great sadness to it. Uh, I know some of the people. I know they have young children. I know one family in particular where they've just had a new baby and they've just gotten a new apartment. He's getting what is called a pink slip. These are terribly tough times that we're going through, and the cuts have gone very much deeper than I think most people realize. New York City gets their taxes once a year, and they need some assistance. Normally, they could gain that assistance by borrowing money until their taxes came in. That's right. But since they no longer have a good credit rating, they cannot borrow. So the funds from the federal government will give them the opportunity to carry over until their taxes come in, at which point they'll repay the loan. Yes, that's correct. Really what we were looking for was a guarantee so that uh, the borrowing could take place. And that's, that's precisely uh, now we are able to borrow to carry us through till when income comes in. And, and within three years, not right now, but within three years, we will be well below our total costs of budgets. Can I ask you a question while we're waiting? That's not fair, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I brought along a quiz. Uh, I want you to tell me what this is, because you're interested in food. Soybean oil, cottonseed oil. This is in order of, of uh, the uh, ingredients printed on the side of the can. Oh, I shouldn't say can. Soybean oil, <laughs> cottonseed oil, non-fat dry milk, water, salt, lecithin, vegetable mono and diglycerides, potassium sorbate, citric acid, artificial flavor, artificial color, and a little bit of vitamin A. What is that? Sounds like the coffee I had this morning here at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you why I brought it along. It happens to be something called Tang. It's an orange drink. I don't have anything against Tang. It sounds but, like you do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you are concerned, and the farmers are concerned, about food that reaches our marketplace. What we are seeing is chemicals reaching our marketplace. We have a big commonality of interest. We would like to get some of that good food that is raised here into our market so that we don't spend our entire time eating uh, red dye number two and things of that kind. So maybe you can help us. <laughs> well, we would like to see more of our food reach your table and less chemicals. We don't produce many chemicals here in Missouri. Precisely, precisely. Besides that, I can't pronounce half of those things anyway. <laughs> Question here. Do you feel like that the fact that cattle prices have been on a money-losing proposition for the cattle producer for the last two years 
Do you feel that the New York consumers should be concerned about this, or is this just a problem that they have to solve on their own? I think for the first time, consumers in New York are concerned about farms and about the future of agriculture and about agricultural policies. We had to become concerned, as, as I hope in a way farm communities are concerned about their consumers and what's happening there. Uh, food prices continue to go up. Not as rapidly, but they continue to go up. We'll go up another 6%. They tell us that next year we're going up again. It isn't getting into the farmer, and we're not getting the benefit of the fact that you're hurting. So it's got to be going somewhere, and I think that's where we join hands, to take a real solid look at what happens from the time it leaves the farm until it reaches our supermarket. Somewhere there are profits. Last year, as opposed to the year before, the cost of food to the average household went up $164. <laughs> And out of that $164, I noted that 152 of it occurred from the time it left the farmer until it got to the consumer. Now, this year over last year, food cost to the average household has gone up $105. And of that, 104 took place from the time it left the farmer until the time it got to the consumer. Quite obviously, the farmer is not benefiting with the increased price that you're talking about. So you see, we have something we can work on together. Uh, there are two things that have happened that we're interested in. The uh, price of pork, of course, went through the sky in our retail markets, and I assume that's obviously because of the shortage. Something is going to happen, though, and the reason I brought the, this along, this little tang thing, uh, at some point, obviously, that very high price is going to result in increased production, right? There is going to be a leveling off. It'll take a while before uh, pork comes back into the market in any quantity so that uh, the supply and demand situation will begin to work. At that point, the nitrites, et cetera, going into bacon are still going to keep the housewife from buying bacon. So you've got an interest in the way food reaches the supermarket, because if your good sows get into You have learned so bacon, much since what? you came to New York. I know what a guilt is, too, you know. <laughs> you know, pardon me for interrupting her, but she had not seen a hog until I showed her one in Missouri. I know, I know. <laughs> it's absolutely true. <laughs> But she showed Go me the subway that. system in New York, too. Yeah, you I like seen hogs like better that. than the subway system. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So, just about as crowded, I would say. <laughs> uh, but very seriously, you can have a situation where your production increases, it gets to market, and we're not going to buy it because it's, we're told it's unhealthy. By the time you put all those dyes and chemicals into everything, and all the preservatives. <coughs> and maybe we need to take a, a, a searching look at that because the farmers and consumers haven't gotten together on that kind of programming. I think the thing about this farmers too, however, is, is some chemicals such as cyclamate, we were told seven years ago is dangerous to your health and we all assumed we were gonna <laughs> meet an early death and go to the morgue tomorrow because we'd eaten or consumed cyclamates. Seven years later now we find out that they're absolutely helpful. This bothers farmers just a little bit too when we find a chemical labeled as being dangerous and then years later we find it was perfectly safe. The State Department has got in all kinds of trouble with the FBI and the CIA and got them in trouble by in being involved with them. Aren't you afraid that the State Department's going to get agriculture in the very same trouble when they interfere so much with problems that are the Department of Agriculture? State Department's been involved in, in food production for a long time, ever since uh, it became obvious that we had something other people wanted. And uh, not only has the State Department been involved in agriculture, but so has the White House and the administration of both political parties. Ever since the farmer lost uh, his power at the ballot box, uh, we pursued a cheap food policy as much as possible in terms of using uh, denial of a foreign market to drive the price down or threats of uh, unloading uh, some of the commodity uh, surplus on the market to drive the price down before the election or whether it involved the State Department in trying to offer to other countries food to achieve certain military objectives. And the farmer has been caught in the middle. And, and this is unfortunate because it, it gives a great instability to the market. The farmer really doesn't know whether to plant another 200 acres of wheat because he's not sure he'll have an opportunity to market his product. He doesn't know whether the government's going to step in and refuse to permit the product to be sold to Russia or Poland because of some kind of foreign policy that they're pursuing that nobody is even acquainted with. Great instability in the market. That's the, the thing, acquainted with. Uh, we resented Secretary of Agriculture Butts because he came into New York about a year after the beef boycott and suddenly he was very angry at everybody and said, you had absolutely no right to do this. You were the ones who destroyed the price of beef. 
uh, you made an impossible situation. We said to him, where were you a year ago? Uh, what we really need from our federal government is a great deal more information. Uh, we don't know what the State Department's up to, and we always find out so much too late. And uh, none of us in New York understood the grain deal. We were upset about it. We were worried that perhaps what was going to happen was another inflationary spiral, which was no good for anyone in this country. How do we get more information? Well, of course. It's all so secret. The big problem is most consumers don't have a grasp of agriculture, economics, or perhaps maybe I should say the American people don't have a good grasp of economics in general, unable to understand or interpret what certain acts, how that will be related to their prices. For example, the longshoremen went on strike supposedly to help the consumer. The government embargoed grain exports supposedly to help the consumer. Those two actions took place precisely at the same time the farmers in Kansas were trying to determine how much wheat they were going to plant. The result being for anybody who has a simple grasp of economics, reduced planting of wheat, less wheat next year, higher food prices to the consumer. Uh, these are simple economics, but they never seem to be conveyed to the American people very well. There's too much politics involved into it. it was, just like uh, the, the tax uh, cut. Nobody can understand what we were trying to do with the tax cut because there was so much political talk involved in it, we couldn't look at straight economics. That's what happened to the Green Deal. We were involved in politics and not economics. The American pu uh, public, could the American public have influenced it or was this all done in camera? Is this all secret? stuff that the American public and the farmer doesn't have a chance to comment on. Well, I think the American public could have influenced it a great deal. I think if the American people had realized that the embargo of grain exports and the longshoreman strike was driving up rather than down the price of food, that Mr. Ford would have been quick to have released the food because I think what he was doing was perfectly uh, obvious. He was trying to appease both Mr. Meany and the voters. And had the voters have been able to interpret what those actions were going to be translated to in terms of price of food, I think the embargo would have ceased. So you're giving us another reason for communication. That's right. Here. Ms. Guggelheimer, I uh, noticed you mentioned nitrate there in the uh, bacon. Uh, I'm Bill Grishow. I'm a farmer. I raise hogs, cattle, corn, soybeans. You mentioned about wiping your shoes off up there. I just want to tell you that when the hog's 63 cents a pound, it don't smell near as bad as it does when they're 30 cents a pound. <laughs> Walker Brents from Park Hill High School, and my question is directed toward Mrs. Guggenheimer. In your, in your position as Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, what do you think is the most common consumer complaint that you hear, and what do you do about it? Well, our most common complaint is furniture. I don't know whether that's true in, around here, but we get late delivery of furniture and defective furniture and somebody orders a dinette set with four brown chairs and gets three green and one yellow <laughs> and uh maybe they shipped it from the post office <laughs> yes <laughs> uh that's our top complaint the second major complaint from the point of view of agony is our automobile repairs and i met with uh, some of the heads of general motors last week in an effort to get them somewhat more responsive. Uh, not, I'm not picking them out. Uh, I'm going to meet with the heads of hopefully every, uh, every Detroit, Flint, and wherever else they're turning them out in the shape that they're turning them out in, which is not satisfactory any longer to the American public. Poor design is another major problem. And that's automobiles, too. Poor design of all kinds of, of products that don't function the way you, should ex the way you expect them to function. Home improvements. Uh, we've got a, a substantial list. How many complaints a year does your office get? Well, we get 400,000. We worry, incidentally, about advertising, too, and about the way children are hit on television uh, by the wrong kinds of ads. And, and uh, oh, dear. I worry when I see my granddaughter picking all those raisins out of the cereal when my daughter-in-law should never have bought cereal with raisins in in the first place. Oh. Should have bought the raisins and cereal separately. I, I buy them together. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I can see where you need consumer education. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like to mix them. I'd rather buy them in a box already there. Yeah, well, <laughs> all I can say is uh, one of the most expensive things for the American consumer, consumer is laziness. You know? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We 
here's something called unit pricing. Do you have unit pricing here? There you have my, my wife does all the shopping. I don't have any well, idea. Have By pricing. the way, quit buying those raisins in the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unit pricing, which is that little tab that goes on the shelf, which allows you to compare one size with another. I'm glad to be able to talk to you. How would you like to get started on standard packaging so people could really compare what they're buying instead of uh, having this high expense I think the thing that bothers me is my wife bought me some deodorant. <laughs> and I opened this big box and found this little bitty bottle. Right on. <laughs> Uh, I've been dealing with the uh, package designers, Council of America, and they, they consider me... Now, there I am really the enemy, because I do think that deceptive packaging has been prevalent, and I think it's outrageous, and I would like to see some control of that, at least. I, I bought for a child some kind of, uh, rec what do you call, rector set? No, it wasn't a rector set. It was some kind of construction thing uh, in, a, in a cylinder this big, and there was about that much stuff in the bottom of it. I mean, I think that's outrageous. Well, that's, uh, that's people that package that package my deodorant. <laughs> 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 Don't you have uh, requirements in New York City that would cause the package to indicate the price per quart, per gallon, yes, per ounce, per something? Yes, that's unit pricing, and that's on the shelf. And I think that's a terrible way to go about it, because it puts an onus on the consumer. They may have to run from one end of a supermarket to another to find uh, two cans of peaches to compare, because a merchant can be very smart. He can, he can have unit pricing, but he can distribute his stuff in such a way that you have an awful time comparing one brand with another. Uh, what I am after is a standard size can and multiples of that, and standard size packaging. Uh, for instance, there are a lot of cereals where you buy 15 ounces in a, uh, in a box this big and 16 ounces in a box that big. Now, that's too much work for the average consumer <laughs> and me. <laughs> I mean, I have terrible trouble when I go shopping. Uh, we've put in a lot of protections that I think may be expensive, and we've only put them in because industry has spent so much money trying to kid you. I think as long as we permit the producers and the various businesses that wrap and package these products, as long as we permit them to camouflage them in different size boxes with different type names and different uh, ah. approaches, uh, this is to their advantage, because yes. the, the less you know about the product and compare one with the other, the more it permits them to drive that price up uh, and to create that additional margin of profit for them. And we've got to break through that some way, and if we do, I think it'll benefit both the producer and the consumer, as does most legislation, I might add. Mm -hmm. And we are not looking for over-regulation, over-legislation. I said before, and I want to repeat this, I think some of the consumer legislation which was designed to try to, to cure something uh, is more costly than the, than the ill, that where the cures are, are unfortunate at times, and we really need to be careful how we do that. Uh, one of the ways to cure it is to, is to make the marketplace a little more honest, and then we wouldn't have to have the legislation and regulation. i put you on a spot right now. I've been working on some legislation. <clears throat> Would you be willing to support <laughs> <laughs> Now in front of God and the whole world. Right? <laughs> legislation. Right now we have legislation which says that uh, we have to include in it the impact it'll have on the environment. Right. Uh, and that's very difficult to determine when we pass a bill, uh, the impact it'll have on the sex life of a bumblebee. I mean, it's hard to, to define sometimes. But we, we're able to do it. Miraculously, we're able to do it. Now, if we can do that, and I'm not knocking that, because I think we do need to be concerned about the environment within certain, if we can afford it. How about attaching to all of our legislation an economic impact, which says this. We're willing now, as we pass the bill, to tell the people what it's going to cost. If we're going to require the farmers and the businessmen to fill out 16 forms, we need to determine what it's going to cost the government to see that the farmer fills out the 16 forms and somebody looks at them when they come in, because that'll be passed on to the taxpayer. We also need to include in the legislation what it's going to cost the farmer himself to take the time to find the figures or the businessman to fill out the forms, because that's going to be passed on to the consumer and increased cost of products and services. Now, if we can show the people what good the legislation is going to do for them, and then say, by the way, you're going to get $10 million in benefits and it's only going to cost you $40 million. 
-hmm. Maybe we may not pass some of this legislation you're talking about that makes it so terribly expensive to produce a product and to sell a service. Uh, I would be entirely in favor of it, provided that uh, it's doable, that it's possible to get an economic impact without uh, going through so many kinds of studies that figures are made to lie. Well, you know, if, yeah. we, can, if we can put an environmental impact statement on legislation, which you admittedly is more difficult to evaluate than economics, yes. then, then why not do it? And so many of the congressmen in Congress, the vast majority of which have never met a payroll in their life, uh, simply will say, well, gee, it's, it's only going to take them uh, a few minutes to fill out these three or four more forms. A few minutes more per week, they're already filling out 63 now. They're spending so much time filling out forms, they don't have time to plant corn or, or produce a product. Maybe we could do that. Who did win the tax cut fight? <laughs> and more important, does the kind of generality about uh, keeping uh, uh, expenditures down equivalent to tax cuts, will that have any practical effect, Jerry, or not? The people won, in my opinion. Uh, you're, you're ducking the question. The Congress or the no, President win? <laughs> no, I, I think the people won. I think the President backed down more than did the Congress because the Congress admitted uh, that they would cut spending if they wanted to. And I think they were prepared to do that anyway. I think the President backed down, but I would say the Congress won the battle. The people won the biggest battle of all. We're just now pulling up out of the recession. And I think it would have been terribly uh, wrong for us to have raised the taxes of the people I think what we ought to do is try to get more people back to work, get them to pay in taxes instead of drawing unemployment compensation, food stamps, and welfare. Get that unemployment rate down at a level that's, that's reasonable, that we can handle. At that stage of the game, I think we have an obligation to the people to cut government spending because it has to be cut, just as it had to be cut in New York City. We can't continue to spend more than we make, to buy more than we sell, to consume more than we produce. That's what we've been doing as a country. But let's not try to make the cuts right now while we're trying to pull up out of this recession. Secondly, let's be honest with the people. Let's talk about our problems. What does a tax cut do? It stimulates the economy. What does a spending cut do? It slows down the economy. Now, what are we trying to do? Win votes or straighten out the economy? To try to do that all at one time with eight million people out of work and the, the, the economy the way it is now is like hitching up a team of horses, one headed north and one headed south, and hitting them on the backside and hollering, whoa. <laughs> now let, let's decide where we're going. And let's quit playing politics. Is this what it boils down to? Are you saying that the pace of recovery will have more effect on the degree to which Congress limits spending rather than this general promise in the compromise? In my opinion. Let's hope so. See, our time has expired, <clears throat> and Eleanor went very quickly. Uh, she and I get to talking about some of these problems, and the, and the day goes by, but uh, it's great of you to come out of New York City, and I, some people out here were, were doubtful that you could even get out of New York City, or would want to go back after you got out. <laughs> but uh, I've enjoyed having you here, and I know your schedule is very busy, and it's marvelous of you to come back to Missouri and uh, have this dialogue with us and share the same kind of a dialogue with the people of Missouri you and I have been sharing with each other for a couple of years. Thanks, Thank Jerry. You. Fun being here. I'd like to say that we hope you can join us next month. Uh, if you can't be here in person, we hope you can uh, to join us on television. Our guest next month will be uh, former Vice President Hubert Humphrey and uh, the man that's now leading the polls and apparently, according to the polls, uh, would beat Ford or Reagan if the election were held today. Following uh, Mr. Humphrey's appearance in that chair, uh, we're going to have uh, FDR Jr. And I think it'd be marvelous to talk about him and his father, the late president, and Eleanor. We hope you join us next month. We continue to bring government to the people. Thank you. Each month, Missouri Congressman Jerry Litton invites a well-known Washington figure to come to Missouri and join him in an unrehearsed two-hour question and answer open to the public town meeting. This has been a 30-minute edited portion of this month's meeting. Dialogue with Lytton is presented monthly on this station to keep you better informed about your government.